very detailed book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it, 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 it has the algorithm book? Yeah, the, uh, the big white. Yeah. The CLRS. Yep. I remember that book. Um, I think they're using the same book for undergrad classes. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's like the city of conflicts in every system yeah. class. Yeah. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So is she going to teach it? Can it offer? No, no, she's not going to teach it. There are going to be some, some faculty and the SFI. I'm not sure if Chris knows what it is. So that's chapter six.
<laughs> I read half of it. Really? Yeah. Uh, all right, well, I'm hoping today to basically complete our discussion of space and games. Um, so, uh, so where I am right now is kind of uh, I don't know, six point six. Six point six. Do I need to say that again to all homeless people? No, we heard you. We're in section six point six. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Good. Um, all right, so uh, so I'm I'm trying to claim again. I, I'm the prover. You're the verifier. And I'm trying to claim that there's a path from S to T. But now I'm trying to claim this in a truly massive graph, the graph of all states that your computer can be in. And if your computer has polynomial memory, then we're looking at this exponential graph of different state space, uh, of different states. And you know, the first thing that we could imagine is, well, okay, this sounds like a something with a single there exists because there exists a path. But the question is, how can I say that to you? Because the path could be exponentially long. So if I say, well, there exists an x0 and an x1 and a blah, 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 then this, you know, in other words, if the witness is the path, it's too big. And because we don't see a direct way to show you a witness which isn't the path, we believe that NP is strictly contained in P space. Okay, so in other words, any problem in P space can be thought of as a reachability problem in this massive graph, okay? Where S is the initial state of the program, and t is a final state in which it says yes. All right, then it will say yes to the input if there exists this path. Um, but this seems to be outside NP because even if the answer is yes, there does not seem to be a polynomial length proof I can show you. Okay. And I, you know, I, I hope this metaphor is clear at this point. I mean, the, the path is the run of the computer. I mean, it is it is the it is the path the computer will take when you run the algorithm through its state space. Okay, but a polynomial, t uh, an algorithm that takes place in polynomial space could take exponential time to run. So I can't show you the entire history of the algorithm, it's too long. So in order to come up with something which is uh, sort of only polynomially deep, involving a polynomial number of different variables, we can do that, but, um, uh, at a cost. So now, again, what I'm going to say is the claim that I can get from S to T in n steps, I will write in the following funny way, which came to us from the middle first strategy. There exists a K such that for all pairs, um, UV, where this, where this pair is either the pair SK or the pair KT, you can get from U to V in N over two steps or less. Okay. So I hope everybody can parse this. I mean, what we're really saying, what we're really saying is this. There exists a K such that we can get from S to K in n over two steps, and we can get from k to t in n over two steps. Okay? Now, the point is though, we want to take this original claim and break it all the way down into claims about single edges in the graph, single steps of the computer. 
Okay. Here, I changed n to n over 2, but I also made my statement about twice as big. Okay. I could do the same thing to each of these. I could say, well, you can get from s to k because there's a midpoint halfway in between them. And you can get from k to t because there's another thing halfway in between them. But now I would be saying something like, you can get from s to z and from z to k and from k to y and from y to t. And now it would be four times as long. And if I keep doing that, by the time I get all the way down to individual edges, what I get is this exponentially long thing that says, well, you can get from the first place to x1 in one step, and you can get from x1 to x2 in one step, and blah, blah, blah. But now I have n things here, right? OK? So all right, what's the game here? I'm trying to express the, the claim that I can get from s to t in a compact way. Okay, I'm trying to express it as a logical statement with only a polynomial length, polynomial number of symbols in my logical statement. If I use this approach, then it's going to blow up because I'm changing one of these R's into two of these R's. Ah, oh, but if I cleverly pack both of these up into this, now there's only one R in the somewhat complicated quantifier. Okay. So now, if I do the same thing to go from n over 2 to n over 4, I'll have just a for an exists, a for all, an exists, a for all, and then r of something n over 4. Sorry, cap these, are, these should be capital Ns. So now, every time I divide n by 2, I just add this to the beginning of the formula instead of doubling the size of the formula, which means that by the time I get all the way down to length 1, how long will my formula be? It'll be log base 2 of n, which is great because that's polynomial in little n, the size of the problem that we're trying to solve. OK? So what I'm saying is by cleverly using these exist and for all quantifiers, we're making the claim that there's a path in an exponentially large graph with only a polynomial number of variables, a polynomial number of symbols. Okay. But there's a cost, which is that rather than just stating that something exists, which is what we're used to, for instance, in NP, now there's this alternation, exists for all, exists for all, exists for all. But like we said last time, that corresponds now to a game. Okay? You're trying to <coughs> claim that this is true, that there is a path. I'm saying, oh, no, there isn't. And you say, well, I claim there exists something. I say, well, show it to me. So you show me some midpoint. That was your move. Now your claim is that with this choice of midpoint, for all blah, blah, blah. And I say, oh, yeah, well, your claim is true for all blah, blah, blah. What about this blah, blah, blah? That's my move. And in particular, so this is this game we described last time where you claim that the midpoint k works. And I say, oh, yeah, what about the second half? And you say, well, for that, this midpoint z works. And I say, yeah, well, what about the first half of that? Okay. And now a path exists if, I have a, if, uh, if the person who's trying to claim this is true has a winning strategy in this game. And the number of rounds of the game is only this many, corresponding to the number of quantifiers. Okay, so it's a polynomial length game.
so, um, so now I want to say a couple of different things. So I want to say that any problem in P space can be thought of as does the first player have a winning strategy? In a game which will last for a polynomial number of moves. So the idea is that games are complete for P space. Okay. So if you had a marvelous game playing program which could look at any game and figure out whether the current player has a winning strategy, you could solve any problem in P space. Conversely, any such game is in P space. And why is this true? So again, let's take, so remember hex, I have an n by n board, some n by n rom board of hexagons. Each move fills in one of them in. At the end, we can tell who won. And the question is, uh, does the current player have a winning strategy? So I claim answering that question for any initial board position is in P space. Why is that? Or tic-tac-toe, right? So we're playing some n by n. Uh, we're playing some n by n generalization of tic-tac-toe. I give you an initial position, and I ask you, does x have a winning strategy? Well, it's x's move, so there's a tree of where, of where x can take the game to by moving in different places. For instance, x could go there or somewhere else, and then it will be o's turn. And at the bottom, when the board is all filled in, or maybe before that, if somebody wins early on, we know who won. And recursively, X has a winning strategy if X has a winning strategy from one of these positions, even though it's O's turn there. So this is a winning position for X if X has a winning move that takes the board to a winning position for X. And then when it's O's turn, this is still a winning position for X if no matter what O does, it goes to if all of these are winning positions for X. So that no matter what O does, X still can win. Okay. So now prove to me that answering this question is in P space. Can you, uh, can you, <clears throat> can you consider also in this case that because there's a lot of games that you have a winning strategy, not starting from the beginning, uh, not starting with the first move. I mean, in such situation. Right. I, I mean, the, the general question I'm asking here is the input to the question is a position on the board. Okay. An arbitrary position, not just the starting position. And I ask from this position, does the, play, does the current player have a winning strategy? Hmm. We can show that, like, that sequence of changes. Uh, there is this thing for also, just for X, it should be always for all. And so yes. Here it should be. Uh, I mean, it, it's true that it means that there exists a winning move. Yes, for X. Such that for all moves that the opponent makes, there exists a move that the first player can do, so that's for all replies the opponent gives, blah, blah, blah. And then inside all these quantifiers is the first player won. And the idea is that telling whether, you know, we're assuming here that I can look at a winning position and tell that someone has won. 
I mean, I don't mean a winning position that they will win. I mean that they've won. Okay. And so yes, I mean that's the connection between this and this. But how do you? How can you prove to me that, that any that any pro, any game, as long as the length of the game is a polynomial number of moves at most, which is true for games where we're filling things in and they never get removed, for instance. Because then on n by n, by n board, there are at most n squared moves before the game is over. Well, what kind of algorithm would you write down to solve this problem? If you were writing a little program to play Connect 4 and you weren't worried about efficiency, depth search. Depth first search since, since you would do an endpoint. Yeah, you would do a depth first search. I mean, you, of the game tree, exactly. So you would you would take this statement that if it's X's turn, this is a win for X. If there exists a, 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 a move that X can make that goes to winning position, and if it's O's turn, if for all moves O makes, it's a winning position for X, you would turn that statement to, into a recursive algorithm. Okay? So it would be something like, you know, so let's say this is like, uh, so this is win and let's call it x win and this returns true if x has a winning strategy. So, you know, you just do some sort of for loop. So for all moves we could get to from here. Okay. If any of them, so if this is the current board position, so if if each move would send you, send you to, let's call P sub i the position you'll go to from position P if you make move i. So if P sub i is a win, return true. So if else, return false. Now this assumes that it's currently X's move. Okay, so do this if it's X's move. And if it's O's move, then if any of them return false, you should return false. Uh, so if not, if any of them isn't a win for you, that's bad because your opponent will go there. Okay. But if there are no good moves like that, then return true. So th this will work only for games where the move space shrinks with each move? Like Not necessarily. I mean, it, as long as the total number of rounds of the game, well, okay, I mean, th this, this works for any game which is guaranteed to end, right? Mm -hmm. You could get in an endless loop. Right. So, for instance, a lot of games like chess and Go, where you could have an endless loop, have some special rule. Like in chess, you're not allowed to be in the same position on the board three times. If you visit the same position on the board three times, it's a draw. Okay. So people invent rules like that so that a game will end. <clears throat> All right. But so we can write this down, and this will work for any game which will end at some point. Right. And of course, the base case is if X has one, return true. If O has one, return false. Okay, so that's the base case of this recursion. Is the idea clear? I know I wrote it messily, but is the idea clear? I mean, how many of you have actually written a little program to play tic-tac-toe or connect four or something? Well, it's worth doing. <laughs> Go do it. Um, all right. So, um, okay. How much memory does this recursive algorithm need to run?
in general, how much memory does a recursive algorithm need to run? When we analyzed, when we showed last time that reachability can be solved in log squared memory, how did we come up with that figure? What does a recursive algorithm generate that has to be stored in the memory? Okay, the depth of the depth of the, the tree. Yeah, the depth of the tree, because as you're exploring this tree, right? I mean, this recursive algorithm will do a depth first, left to right traversal of this tree, and how much memory does it need to do that? Log log of the total space. I don't know what that means. Which is log of exponential? Should be just log of. When it's at some point in the middle of, you know. When it's already explored this entire line of play, and both of these, there was something the opponent could do. So both of these led to disaster. So we're now checking to see if this is a winning move. And we've, we've gone down to some point here in the game tree. What is sitting in memory? Wonder. The stack. Yes. yes, the stack of the recursive algorithm, which in this case is the current path in the tree. Mm -hmm. Right. So the amount of memory we need is basically the amount of memory we need to hold the current path from the original position that the user asked the algorithm <coughs> about down to the current one. <coughs> so if each one of these is pretty easy to store, like it's a little end by end board with a couple of little symbols about what kind of piece there is on each square or if there is one. Well, then this, the amount of memory we need here is basically the depth of the tree and the maximum depth of the tree is polynomial, polynomial because it's the maximum length, is the maximum number of moves in the game, okay. right? So if you have a game which could go on for an exponential number of moves, so we have to search exponentially deep in this tree, well then, uh, we might not be able to do that within polynomial space. But as long as every, as long as every game is over after a polynomial number of moves, this tree is only polynomially deep, and to do a depth first search of it, we only need polynomial memory. All right. Good. So, well, um, there are lots of games. Like I said, for instance, those where uh, you know, at every move something is added and nothing gets removed, so once the board is full, the game is over. All of those games, that means they're in p-space. There are games where something gets removed at each step. So there is a, um, there is a Japanese, uh, sorry, there's a Hawaiian game called Konane. I had the pleasure of playing this once with, uh, with pieces made of coral and lava uh, on the big island against the little Hawaiian kid who beat me easily. Um, so it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of like peg solitaire. You start out with a, a board full of a checker, checkerboard of black and white pieces, and you remove two in the middle to get things started. And now at each move, you hop one of your pieces over an opponent's piece. So if you're... If you're black here, you could do this, and you remove the opponent's piece. And the first person who does not have a legal move, so every move has to capture, the first person who can't do anything loses. So it's a nice little game. And here, something gets removed at every step. So there's no way the game can last more than n squared moves on an n by n board. This is called Konani. Um, so, uh, all right. Then again, there are other games like chess where it's not obvious. I mean, it certainly seems that between humans, one rarely would have a game of exponential length. Um, and there are also some special rules here. Like there's a rather obscure rule that says that if it's been 50 moves and there's been no capture and neither king has been placed in check, it's a draw. But let's ignore that, that rule. If you ignore that rule, it seems that a game of chess could go on for exponentially many steps. Because things can just move around and you know, there might not be any captures for a long time. 
Also in the game of Go, uh, I won't, I won't uh, well, I'll explain the rules of Go in a, in a moment because I have to, I want to show you something there. Um, but in the game of Go, you, pieces can be added and then removed and then put back on the board and then removed <coughs> many times. So, um, all right. Okay, so, but there seems to be this very nice connection between piece space and games. So a logical question is, now that we know that any game, that a lot of games can be solved in piece space, but we know that every problem in piece space can be thought of as a kind of funny game, this name the midpoint and then name, you know, zero in on one half of the, ed of the path or the other. Well, what about the games that humans like to play? Are any of them piece space complete? Okay. So are there, any, are there any games where this problem of telling whether the current player has a winning strategy is not only in P-Space, but is among the hardest problems in P-Space, where it's as hard as any other problem in P-Space? That would be rather pleasing. I mean, and that might tell us why that game is so hard. So the answer is yes. Not only is the answer yes, but a whole ton of games are known to be P-Space complete or P-Space hard. So um, uh, including Hex. So by the way, it's been four days since I asked you to prove that Hex has a winning strategy for the first player. Did anyone do that? Or did you look it up? It's OK if you looked it up. No? When I give you these exercises, you don't immediately go do them? You have other things to do? Well, let's, let's prove this. <sighs> okay, so here's my hex board. And so you remember the rules. Black and white take turns placing stones on these hexagons. Black is trying to make a path of his color from, say, here to here. White is trying to make a path of her color from here to here. Okay? So first, prove to me that there are no draws. Because whenever one gets... I mean, it's kind of blocking each other. Yeah, if white is blocking black completely, then white finished uh, mm. its pass. So if I agree that if the board gets full, there's no way for black to have a path from here to here <coughs> and for white to have a path from here to here. But you also need to prove that at least one of them does. Okay. So I agree that they can't both, but you also have to prove that it can't be the case that neither does. By the time black can fill the first row so that to block the white to go into his uh, this side, the, white, the black can go all the way. Yeah, but you don't know that black has filled in a whole row. It seems like if, if black didn't have the whole row, there's always a way for white. Mm -hmm. Well, not necessarily. I mean, black could have a path which is a zigzag like that, and everything else could be white. It doesn't have to be a solid row. I mean, doesn't that consider an, an, I mean, is it a when you black? I mean, I mean, the thing is, right, on the square lattice, this isn't true. I mean, on the square lattice, if we alternate black and white, mm -hmm. then at least if a path means if you're not allowed to step diagonally like this, then neither neither color has a path. Okay? okay. But there's something about the hexagonal board where if we fill it all in with black and white stones, then then black has a path or white has a path. Not neither and not both. All right, well, I'm going to make you think about that some more. For now, let's assume that, okay? Let's assume that there are no draws, that in every position where the board is full, one of the two players is one. So now prove to me that the first player, that starting from a blank, starting from the blank uh, 
playing position here. Prove to me that the first player has a winning strategy. So no one did this or look it up? <laughs> I know it's late in the semester, but you're probably busy with some massive project. I understand. All right, well, it's going to be a proof by contradiction. Suppose, well, so first of all, let me make the following claim. If there are no draws, then either the first player has a winning strategy or the second player has a winning strategy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, if it's not the first, it's the second. Suppose the second player has a winning strategy. Okay. What should the first player do? The idea is that the first player could steal the second player's strategy. For some reason, one who is irrelevant. The first player throws a stone down anywhere, okay. like there. Now the first player pretends that that stone isn't there. And now the first player says, OK, it's your turn. Now the first player pretends that he's the second player. Okay. And now he uses this winning strategy that the second player supposedly has, that we assume the second player has. But and the point is, this extra stone can only do good. This extra stone cannot help white, can only hurt white and help black. So the second player, sorry, the first player plays as if this stone weren't there until this winning strategy tells him that he ought to go there. Then what should he do? Go ahead. Go somewhere else. Throw another stone down anywhere else you like. Okay. And you another time. <laughs> right. So the point is that, so we talked last time about how we have this intuition that the first player in a game has an advantage. Okay. In this case, the first player really does have an advantage. We can really prove that intuition because in this case, having this extra stone can never hurt. It can only help. Okay. So that's the proof. <laughs> but this is a proof by contradiction. Proof by contradictions are non-constructive. They tell us nothing about the thing that we're trying to find. They only show us that it exists. So this told us absolutely nothing about what the first player's winning strategy is, only that he has one. And we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. We know by experience that moving in the center is, pretty, is a pretty darn good idea. So when people actually play this game, there are several, ways, several modifications you can do to make the first player's advantage less. One thing you can do is just don't make your first move in the center. Another thing you can do is the first player goes, and then the second player gets to decide whether he wants to continue the game or whether he wants to, that to be his move and for him to go first. So it's like cutting a cake, where I cut the cake and then you choose which piece. Right? So this encourages me to cut the cake fairly. Okay. okay? Yeah. So that's another clever way to even out the first player's advantage. It's also, this game is also nice because if, if a friend of yours, if, you, if you're really good at this game and a friend of yours is learning it for the first time, you can give your friend a couple of extra stones. So that's a nice way to give them, give yourself a handicap. Um, all right, so uh, the first player has a winning strategy in hex, but we don't know what it is. But if I give you as input a particular, uh, a particular initial position, and then I ask you, now does the current player have a winning strategy? This is piece space complete. This is as hard as any problem which can be solved in polynomial space. So any other problem can be reduced to this one in polynomial time. But I'm actually, I'm not going to prove that. Instead, I'm going to use Go. So first I have to tell you about Go. And this whole proof is, you know, this is all in the book. Um, dum -de -dum. Uh, <clears throat> so, but before I do, before I do go, I'll do another one called geography.
So. All right. So the first thing I'm going to prove to you is that the following problem, which is called quantified SAT, some people call it quantified Boolean formula, is P-space complete. And I need to tell you how to define this problem. The idea is that we just, we start out with some three SAT formula. Sorry, these are ORs. So I take some three SAT formula. Now, normally, what are we interested in? We're interested in whether it's satisfiable and, and logically, what is that saying? Is your choose assignment? Right, and what kind of quantifier is that? Yeah, so normally, so the NP complete problem is where I say there exists an X1 and an X2 and an X3 such that this is true. Well, as you can imagine, the natural thing to think about is where I make these alternate between exists and for alls. So now, this is a little game where I choose the value of x1, I set it true or false. Then you, choose, you set x2 to true or false. Then I set x3 to be true or false. And we go through all n variables that way. And then we check this three sat formula to see if it's true, if it's satisfied by the assignments we chose. And this formula is the same as the statement that the first player has a winning strategy in this game. Okay. So the idea is that I can change that reachability game into this. So I do our middle first thing where one player chooses the midpoint, the other player chooses which half to focus on. And I do that all the way down until I get to a core which is asking about single steps of the computation, single edges in the state space graph. And remember way back when we, when we proved that three, stat, three sat is NP complete, <coughs> we said, well, any program can be written as this circuit and we can change the circuit into a three sat formula. So in the same way, the idea is that I could conceivably take any program and compile it all the way down to a three sat formula. That would, and what I mean specifically is that if I give you state one of the workspace and then state two of the workspace, the claim that one step of computation will take me from here to here, I could write as a three set formula. Right? And that's the base case of our reachability game. We keep arguing about whether I can get from here to here in n steps, n over two steps, n over four steps, until finally we're asking, does one step of computation take me from here to here? So if you believe that we can transform that problem, which is after all that single step, it increments some variable or sets something equal to something else. If we can express that as a three sat formula, then we're done. Okay. Are you happy with that? We could belabor this point if you like, but all right. All right. So now here's a game called geography. And the nice thing about geography is it's like a two player version of reachability or maybe of Hamiltonian path. So in geography, there's a directed graph. And we have some initial vertex. Okay, so uh, the idea is that you, it's your, you, you're the first player. You decide where to go from here. Then I decide where to go from there. Then you decide to go here, and I decide to go here. But now you're stuck because we're not allowed to visit the same place twice. Okay? So we take turns walking on this graph. And the first person where all the places you could go to from there have already been visited, so you're at a dead end, that person loses. 
So this is inspired by a word game that um, I do actually remember playing when I was a kid, but this memory might be fictional. Um, the idea is that somebody says, you know, uh, Newark, the in the east, and then Newark ends in K, and then somebody else has to name a city that begins with K, like uh, Kazakhstan. That's a country, right? Kazakhstan. Um, <laughs> what? Kansas. Kansas is a state. Kansas City. Kansas, Kansas City, thank you. Kansas City, uh, which ends with a Y, and then you could have Ypsilanti, which is in Michigan. Anyway, so you keep doing this, and you're not allowed to name the same city twice. And this is kind of like a graph. I mean, it is a graph uh, where the vertices are cities, and there's an edge from here to here if this one begins with the same letter that that, end, that one ends with. Okay, So this is like your standard computer science-y thing of taking this nice familiar game and generalizing it to directed graphs. Right? So I claim that when played even on graphs of polynomial size, graphs of n vertices, telling whether the first player is a winning strategy is NP-complete. Uh, sorry, P-space complete. Okay. So first of all, think about that for a moment. So here's P, here's NP. P space is like way up here, right? Because this is just one there exists. And this is any polynomial number of alternating things. So this is kind of cute because telling whether I can get from one place to another, reachability, is in P. In fact, as you know, it's in NL. It's way down there. Hamiltonian path, telling whether I can visit each place exactly once, is NP-complete. Okay, that's still a solitaire game, but now with this funny constraint that I want to visit everywhere and I can't visit any place twice. Once you introduce interaction between two players, the complexity jumps all the way up to here, to P-space. So let's prove that geography is P-space complete. So I'm going to reduce from quantified set. All right. So what do I need? Well, once again, just it, it kind of like uh, for Hamiltonian path or whatever, for all our NP completeness proofs, I need choice gadgets and I need constraint gadgets. So before, we, so, so I, I, we need parts of the graph where we sort of go one way or the other, and that will correspond to setting these variables. And then we'll have parts of the graph where we now check to see if this three sat formula is true. Okay? But this time, it'll be alternating players that choose the values of these alternating variables. So first, let me point out something, which is that even after all these variables are set, there's still a kind of little game we can play to see whether this three-set formula is true. So I claim that all of these clauses are satisfied. Okay? So I claim that we have found a satisfying assignment. You claim we haven't. How does the game work? This is an and of ors. So I claim that all clauses are satisfied, and what it means for each clause to be satisfied is for at least one of these three literals to be true. So how do we turn this into a game? Choose which one. Yeah. one, two, three. Yeah, so, so one player is going to choose which clause to focus on. Is that the player who's trying to prove that it's satisfied or the one who's trying to prove it's unsatisfied? Satisfied. Mm -hmm. Satisfied. The, the one who wants to prove this is not satisfied. 
Right. To show, that it, to show that it's not satisfied, all the dissatisfier player needs to do is find one clause yeah, which is unsatisfied. Yeah. Right. And uh, another one. Right. right. So the player who, who claims that it's unsatisfied says, I claim this clause isn't satisfied. <coughs> but then how does the player who thinks that it is satisfied reply? Sign you show that for any values. By choosing one of those. By saying, look, x7 appears in here and x7 <coughs> is true. Okay? All right? So this and of ors is already a little game. It's, I mean, after all, another way to say that all clauses are satisfied is that for all upside down a clauses, there exists upside down e, one of the literals in that clause which is true. So there are your two moves in the game. <coughs> Okay. So that's how the game is going that's how the, the game is going to end after we're done setting variables. <clears throat> so um, here's how it looks. So we start here. And um, the first player gets to set x1. And they do that by going here or by going here. Going here corresponds to setting x1 true, going here corresponds to setting x1 false. Okay? Now the second player doesn't have any choice, they go here. And now the first player doesn't have any choice, they go here. These two little choiceless moves are just to sort of complete the gadget and get us ready for the next gadget. Now it's the second player's move. She gets to decide whether to go here, corresponding to set x2 true, or here, setting x2 false. And then the first player does this, and then the second player does that. And now it's the first player's turn. So this is the first player. This is the second player. Now it's the first player's turn to set x3, and so on. OK? Now, once we're all done with that, so the first player claims that the whole thing ends up being true. So now let's say that we have this clause and this clause. OK, so the first player says both these clauses are satisfied. And the second player says, mm, prove to me that this one is. Second player chooses which clause to look at. The first player replies and says, but my friend, this, this is satisfied because, uh, because I can, since I set x1 true, we can now go from here to, uh, let's see. Well, let's do it this way. And then this will point to not x1 and x2 and not x3. OK, so the way I've done it this way, the first player, um, second player wins? Drat, hold on. Maybe we do want to switch these. I guess I just found a typo in the book. So, uh, well, okay, let's have them, point, sorry, we'll have, we'll have them point there, but let me say something then. If the first player wants to set x1 true, what she does is she avoids this vertex and goes here instead. Okay? And that way this vertex is still available so we can move there at the end of the game. Right? So let's say the first player sets x1 true by going here. Now this has been used. We cannot visit again. Now we go here and here. And now let's say the second player uh, sets x2 false by visiting x1. x1. Uh, wait. Darn it. Help me out here. 
You would choose to go to x. Right, setting x to false, yes, yes, by going to x to true. So, so now x to false is still available. But that was a good move for the second player because both of these clauses want x2 to be true. And maybe the first player sets, uh, let's say the first player sets x3 false by visiting this place. Okay? So now we go around. And now if the second player, who I call the skeptic, the person trying to argue that this isn't true, if they focus on this clause, the prover, the first player, can go there and say, well, this clause is satisfied because we set x3 to be false. And if the skeptic asks about this clause, the prover can go there and say, well, this clause is satisfied because we set x1 to be true. OK? Are you happy with this reduction? Yay or nay? Yay? Nay? What's, what's the issue? So, I mean, by, by going through these gadgets. They're trying to check reachability from all of that vertices which represent clauses. So, I mean, by going through these gadgets, we set variables by visiting and thus blocking for the future one of these two vertices and leaving the other one available. Okay, so for instance, to set x1 true, we block the vertex where x2 is false and leave this one available. The two players take turns setting these variables. And after we set all the variables, now finally, the second player decides which clause to look at. The skeptic decides which clause to look at. Says, show me how this clause is satisfied. And the prover responds by saying, oh, it's satisfied because of this literal. And I can go to this literal because it's still available because I went the other way to this gadget. And that was my way of setting this variable true. So you only do one clause and then one variable. And that's the end of the game. Exactly. All the clauses. Yeah, I mean, that's the, right. And this is the clever thing about games, right? <clears throat> so what we really want to know is, I, I, have, I have a thousand clauses. I want to know if they're all satisfied. But that's the same as asking, does the prover have a winning strategy? where the skeptic gets to point at one of them. And then the prover gets to look at one of, gets to choose one of the literals. Okay? So the idea is that if, if any of them were not satisfied, we could rely on the skeptic to move there. To say, show me that one. Okay? So what's going on here is, you know, games are very <coughs> computationally powerful. I mean, if if you have very smart players in the question of of who has a winning strategy is equivalent to some very interesting sorts of search problems. Um, and uh, yeah, so if, if, there, if any of the clauses were not satisfied, that's the one the skeptic would choose. So if the prover has a winning strategy, they're all satisfied. So if I, you know, this is certainly a polynomial time reduction. If I start out with a, uh, you know, if I start out with a three sat formula with n variables and m clauses, clearly I have order n vertices plus order m vertices, and I will get a, a I get a, a graph of polynomial size. Okay. So, are we beating a dead horse yet, or is this? Is this the lost glazed or this is the obvious glaze? Or my blood sugar is at its nadir in the afternoon glaze? All right. OK. Well, let me sketch the proof that Go is piece-space complete. Um, actually, not piece-space complete, but piece-space hard, which means it's at least piece-space complete and could be worse. And indeed, we believe that it is worse. So how many of you already know the rules of Go? 
Okay, well, the rest of you, you really should learn Go. It's really, it's really one of the best games. I'm not very good at games, but I, I really like Go. So Go has been around for something like 5,000 years. Um, and uh, <clears throat> its rules are incredibly simple and its strategies are very deep. So um, here's the idea. So we take turns, white and black, black goes first traditionally. We take turns placing stones on this board. And um, if one group of stones gets surrounded by another, then they're taken and removed. So for instance, if black just went here, black would say Atari, which sort of means like check or on guard. And I guess that's where the company got its name. Because white stones are in danger of being taken. If white doesn't do something, then in black's next move, black will go there and take these two stones. Um, on the other hand, maybe there's something else going on at the same time, like this. So uh, for instance, um, white could reply by going here and taking black stone and remo removing it from the board. Or white could go there, and now white has more what are called liberties, which are blank spaces around that which would need to be filled in in order to surround it. And you know, black could still try to surround it. But one thing that might happen is this. So um, let's say white goes here. Okay. Well, black says, darn these white stones, I want to surround them. So black will go here. Well, now white could go here. Well, gosh, really want to capture those stones. So now black goes here. And now white goes here. And this is something called a ladder. And it'll go in a zigzag up like that. OK? Now, um, a couple different things could happen here. Uh, if, there is, if, there is, if this is just going to run into the edge of the board, then black will win. OK? So between players who've been playing the game more than once or twice, we'll sort of see where this is going, right? If we're just going to hit the edge of the board, then white should have given up right away and spent her stones going somewhere else on the board. Because at the end of the game, what happens is typically there's some territory which is firmly surrounded by one color. And I'm not going to go into why territory is secure. But at the end of the game, your score equals the number of blank spaces of territory you can you control plus the number of prisoners you've taken. Okay? So if you know that your group of stones is going to die, you should let it happen as soon as possible. Other I mean if white keeps going this way and loses all of them anyway, white has just handed a bunch of additional points to black. Okay. But maybe white isn't going to lose, because maybe as we extend this line outward, there's a white stone here. Okay. Now something nice will happen, which is as soon as we hook up with this white stone, now white survives. Specifically, what happens is white will have more liberties. Right? What, what happens in this ladder is that white is constantly in check. White has just one liberty. White goes there. Now black goes here. Now white has just one liberty. Okay? So white is always one move away from death. If you hook up with a white stone there, though, white gains some breathing space. Okay? And maybe, meanwhile, over here, there's a huge group of black stones, which is almost entirely surrounded by white stones. And as soon as white gains that little extra bit of breathing space, White can gain a huge amount of territory. And it's only because white has been in check that white hasn't been able to do that. OK? Good. All right. So if you look at um, figures 612 through 615 or so on page, starting on page 
212 of your of your hymn book, <coughs> book um, you'll see that these the way these ladders work, there are cute choice gadgets that this smart guy named Bob Hearn devised. Where at these choice gadgets, white can choose. So there are white choice gadgets and black choice gadgets. These are on page 213. Where at a white choice gadget, white can choose whether to send the ladder continuing this way or this way. And at a black choice gadget, black can choose to send it this way or this way. Okay. So now you see how this might work. There are also mirrors. So it turns out if you have a little thing like this, then if you just pursue the optimal line of play, what happens is the two players hit this and it bounces off like that. So what happens then, and this is uh, a, big, uh, a big one is shown on page 215. So on 215, there's a reduction for the same three sat formula we had here. So what happens is white gets to send the ladder this way or this way. And in the center here is a white stone. And then black gets to send it this way or this way. And this, this, so this corresponds to setting x1 true or false. And this corresponds to setting x2 true or false, and so on. And then there's a choice gadget where black gets to decide which clause to look at. And if he wants to look at this clause, for instance, He's, he bounces it off a mirror, which goes all the way around here. And then white gets to decide whether to, whether, which of these gadgets to send it toward, which correspond to the three variables it could be satisfied by. And, um, and let's see, I guess this is meant to be true, false. And if any of these things are, uh, if any of these things are true, then white can send the ladder towards one of these white stones and survive. And that's the idea of the reduction. Okay. So again, we have choice gadgets, and it again ends with uh, one player deciding which clause to look at, and the other player then deciding which literal to use to satisfy that clause. So this is just a little subset of Go, actually. I mean, Go is a much Go isn't just about these ladders bouncing around. I mean, actually, like I said, in in real games between good players, these ladders hardly ever happen because people just look to see what will happen, and they either give up right away or don't start it. Right? If white is going to survive, black shouldn't waste all this time. And if white is going to die, shouldn't you know shouldn't defend the group hopelessly. Um, but the cute fact is that if these choice gadgets are around, it's not obvious what will happen. So they actually kind of have to play this out and see what choices they could make. And white has a winning strategy if the quantified SAT formula is true. Okay. So this, this says that playing Go optimally, telling who has a winning strategy, is at least as hard as quantified SAT, which in turn is at least as hard as any problem in PSpace. So um, it turns out that Go, Go is even worse than this. So um, it turns out that Go is known to be exponential time hard. So remember, that's up here above P space. And this is because there are kind of funny, very admittedly very artificial setups in Go where the length of the game really has to be, the game has to last for an exponential number of moves to see who's going to win. Now, humans don't set up these situations. 
there's almost, you could almost say there's a tacit agreement between human players not to set up situations that are this computationally complex. So, you know, you could well argue how much do these complexity results have to do with the fact that experimentally Go is a deep and interesting game? Well, you know, what you can say is that what you can say is that there's no polynomial time strategy which just plays the game perfectly. And it does feel as if, you know, so that that's that's at least so it's it's a it's a it's a proof that unless well actually for Go because exponential time we know that's bigger than P we really know this but even for other games like Hex that are P space complete we're saying that unless P equals P space which would be even wilder than P equaling N P um, there's no polynomial time algorithm for perfectly playing Hex and maybe this is partly why humans find it deep and fun and interesting um, you can argue about that. Uh, it's a little bit like asking, you know, it's kind of the same question as saying, well, just because a problem is NP complete, does this mean it's hard in practice? Well, the difference, though, is that in a game, it is a competitive situation. So if I knew there were positions that were too complex for you to think about, that I could think about, well, I would try to move the game in that direction. Um, so figuring out somehow what a typical position here is is maybe more confusing and hard than figuring out what a typical Hamiltonian path problem is. So let me just finish by, although I won't prove it, um, mentioning another type of problem which is also p-space complete, which is these sliding block puzzles. Okay, so you have some wooden blocks of various sizes and shapes and you have some blank spaces in here. And you want to know whether there's a sequence of moves which will, you know, maybe you have a box here and the box has a hole in it. And you want to know, is there a sequence of moves which will allow you to take this block and move it out through the hole? Okay? These puzzles have a long and honorable history. There are some web pages with, you know, hundreds of these that you can play on applets and so on. And, well, there's a nice computer science problem here, right? I can clearly show you one of these in some nice discrete format and ask you whether it's solvable. So this is P-space complete. And the reason is that, um, well, first of all, this suggests that the number of moves you need to do might be exponentially large as a function of n, where n is, say, the total number of cells in all these blocks, right? I mean, after all, if the, if the length of the path were only polynomial, then we could solve this problem in polynomial time. Okay. Or, let's see, is that obvious? Th then it would be an NP, sorry. If, if the length of the path, if the number of moves were only polynomial, then there would be a witness that we could check in polynomial time, namely the sequence of moves. Mm -hmm. so the fact that this is p-space complete suggests that in general, there are puzzles where the length of the shortest solution and the number of moves is exponentially long. And indeed, there are, there are particular cute puzzles people have designed um, that, where this is provably true. So there's one puzzle designed by a puzzle designer. You know, there's this whole subculture of these designers that get together and have conventions and show each other their puzzles. There's a guy named Junk Cato that came up with a clever one where these are the blocks, and then there's this narrow space you can move them through, and then there are spaces up here and spaces down here, and you're trying to move them into these positions. And this turns out to be a lot like the Towers of Hanoi. So the number of moves grows exponentially with the number of blocks. Okay. Well, we still don't know that NP is smaller than P space. So you could ask, well, what, what would it mean if NP and P space were the same? Well, what this would mean here is that there's some way to prove to you that there is a solution which 
which you can check in polynomial time, but which isn't the sequence of moves. <laughs> right? It would mean that there's some less direct way of proving that there's a solution okay. than showing it to you, because the solution is too big. And we don't believe that there is such a thing. OK? All right. So any questions about this stuff? I mean, my goal, so some of you have looked at last semester's comps, I know. And I asked this question about sliding block puzzles. And I also asked you this at the beginning of the semester. I said, well, there's these sliding block puzzles, and then there are these peg puzzles where we hop one peg over another and remove the one we hopped over. The peg puzzles are in NP because we know that the sequence of moves is at most the number of pegs because a peg gets removed by every move. But here we don't think that's true. Actually, and we know that sometimes it's exponentially long. So one student on last year's comps gave the most beautiful answer to this question. I asked, which of these are in NP? He said, well, this is in NP because we know there's at most n moves if there are n pegs. This is in P space because, because I can do this in polynomial memory, right? I could do a search, a massive search, and each configuration only requires a polynomial number of bits to encode it. So I can do it in polynomial memory. But it seems like sometimes we need an exponential number of moves. So it's not obvious we could do it in NP. But if there were a witness which is less direct than actually showing you the number of moves, then maybe it is NNP. Okay. That's a very, very good answer to that question. P-space complete. It's Proving that this is, I did not ask on the comps to prove this is P-space complete. So to prove it that, it, that it's P-space complete, there's a little in figure uh, on, on page um, 216, there's sort of an example of the type of gadgets that are involved. So there are these funny gadgets people have designed where you can slide this block out in only if you slide both of these out. So it's like an AND gate. And then there's another gadget where you can slide this one in if you can slide this one or that one. So you can set up logical circuits here where the whole thing is forced to carry out a computation as you slide things back and forth. Um, just one other example of something which is P-space complete. This was popular a couple of years ago. Does anyone still play this? Sokoban? So this is this little game. It's called the, the Warehouseman's Game. So it's like you're this little guy who can move north, south, east, or west, oh, and there are these crates. Push. And you can push the crates around, yeah. but if you get them up against a wall, you can't get behind them and move them back out again. Uh -huh. And you're trying to get them through these various hallways into the right places. Yeah. So it's a solitaire game, but sometimes the number of moves is exponentially large as a function of the number of cells in the puzzle. And so the whole thing is also P-space complete. All right. So what we're going to do next time is talk a little bit, I think in the remaining three lectures, I want to talk a little bit about randomized algorithms. And um, so there's next Thursday, and then there's two next week, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to post one more little homework, but it's only going to have like six problems on it. And then, then we'll be almost done. We're done with the book then, right? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to email you the chapter on randomized algorithms. I don't really expect you to read it before next Thursday, but I want you to have access to it while we go through the lectures. Okay. All right. See you Thursday, unless you're coming to office hours. And you, I owe you an apology. I got stuck with Stephanie on Thursday, and I saw you leaving the building. I'm sorry about that. I actually tried to email you, and I couldn't find your email. So. Uh, no, but today and Thursday, I will. Okay. What do you think? I'm open both days. Yeah, sorry.
I I got used to working on the res and all had computers, so I printed everything and then I remembered, oh you guys are students, you all have technology and thank you. Yeah, thank you for listening. I can't believe I forgot to mention a couple of things. I feel like I talked so long but I forgot to mention a few things that I wanted to say. Yeah. Well, it goes back first time. Yeah. That's actually my first class. Thanks, Lloyd. Interesting. Yeah. This one is three pages. You got to get middle and then back pages. I might do it if I have three. Another three weeks. So. And I can email them to you for oh, okay. groups. And that one doesn't have to go. I'm going to keep whatever's left for this afternoon. If I could get a list of